Hello everyone, this is Dr. Webb and welcome to this Calculus 1 video. So let's start this video off with a question. Um, so here we have a graph of a function um, and, and we want to try and figure out what's the area under this function above the x-axis, uh, this yellow area. And so this is the area under, under the function from the x-values 1 to 4. Okay. We see this is not, you know, kind of a standard, you know, rectangle or circle or something that's really easy to, to find the area of. Um, it's, it's a, you know, pretty wavy function. So how can we go about, you know, we're not even asking for, uh, it might be too much to ask for what's the exact area. So how can we even get a good guess? Well, first thing that might help is if, you know, we actually kind of broke this down a little bit. So... Here we sort of added a, a grid onto this. And the nice thing about adding to grid is that rather than trying to think about the whole thing at once, we can kind of break this down into smaller pieces. And so if we're looking in the x direction, um, each of these pieces here is between these grid markings is each one across. And so maybe over each of these sub intervals, these three sub intervals, uh, maybe we can estimate the area over them. Now, even in the, this first one, between 1 and 2, um, still it's not the most obvious thing to do, and so maybe we pick sort of some height that looks maybe like it represents it pretty well over this region. So let's say something maybe about 2.5 high. And so it seems to me like maybe the area of that rectangle there is about equal to the area of, of the yellow section there. And maybe we can do the same thing between two and three. Maybe we break it off right about there. Talk about that area and maybe between three and four. Oh, let's say, let's maybe let's use two and a half again. Okay, and so Rather than trying to do the whole thing at once, we're breaking this up into three subregions and then doing each subregion with a rectangle. Now, why would we choose rectangles? Well, rectangles are nice because it's really easy to find the area of them. And so this rectangle right here, it's two and a half high, one wide. And so the area of this rectangle here is going to be two and a half times one which is two and a half. The second rectangle, it's two high and one across, so its area is gonna be two. Third one, we also made at two and a half. And so our guess for the area is gonna be 2.5 for the first one, plus two for the second one, plus 2.5 for the third one, which is gonna be seven. Seventh our estimate for that area. Okay, now, what could we do to make this approximation a better, right? Well, so it's still, you know, doing this one across with one across in width all the way across. This, this certainly was easier than doing it, uh, trying to do the whole thing at once. So maybe if we broke it down further, it'd make things even easier. And so now we can see, now we've broken this up into six different regions where each one here is exactly one half across and now we can do sort of the same process as before so maybe for this first one let's approximate it with this rectangle at three second one maybe let's do that one maybe at two and a half third one maybe let's do this at two Fourth one, we could do this at two and a half. Next one, oh, let's do this right about there. Oh yeah, let's pick the top there. And this last one, maybe we'll do it right there. So let's pick the values for here. So this is, this first rectangle is three high and its width is only one half. 
and so the area of this one is 1.5. Now the second rectangle, it looks like it's at 1.75 and half across. And so that would be 1.75 divided by 2 would be 0.875, I believe. This third one is one and a half high and half across. So that would be 0.75 would be its area. Next one is 2.5 in height and half in width. So that would be 1.25. This one is at about three and a quarter. And so divide that by two would be 1.625. And then this fourth one, see we did it at two, but it's only one half wide, so it has area one. And so now if we add these together, so our new estimate for the area would be Adding together all these area of these smaller rectangles. Plus one. And let's see, that is equal to seven as well. How about that? Um, but I think we can be, you know, this, this should make us feel more confident about the 7 because uh, these rectangles seem to be a fair bit closer to uh, the, the actual areas than, than what we had with the wider ones. And we could make the, we could break things down even smaller and smaller and make this, you know, say even more and more precise. Say. And... I'm not actually going to calculate this out, but kind of get the idea that we could just keep doing this, getting it smaller and smaller, get thinner and thinner rectangles, and be able to approximate this better and better. Okay. Now let's think about how we would automate this process. Um, so how, you know, in, in the way that we were choosing the, the heights of the rectangles before, we were kind of looking at it and being, you know, kind of picking some of the height that we thought was appropriate. Um, now let's think about how we could, you know, have a computer do this for us, um, trying to make this as simple as ourselves as possible. Okay, so here we've broken it up, the x direction, into widths of half again. all the way across and now we still want to use rectangles because they're easy to do but now we got to pick heights of these rectangles and you know we've been we sort of were doing it before just by saying by eye and this this height looks like it makes it about equal how can we how can we do it with you know without having without saying let's say we're not able to actually see it um, well so we'd want to be able to in each of these sub intervals We'd, be able, we'd want to pick some height that might be close. And we want something that's going to be close to, you know, sort of the, the height overall of the, of the function on that interval. And so it would probably make sense to pick some value of the function on the interval there. And so what are some different ways we could do that, given the information we have? Well, we could say pick all of the right endpoints as our heights. and build our rectangles there. And if you notice on some of these, we're gonna be overestimating by quite a bit, but also on some of them, we're gonna be underestimating for quite a bit. And so maybe that those two cancel themselves off. Um, on the other hand, we could choose the right endpoints. So in that case, all of these rectangles would be going the opposite way. And if you notice here again, we have some that are going to be overestimating, some that are going to be underestimating. Um, 
We also could even say, pick the middle point of each interval. So we pick the x value halfway in between, go up from there, and pick that as our height. Halfway in between, find the function value there, use that as our height. Same thing here. Looks like it's about right there. This one here is at the top. This one here is about there. And then use those rectangles as our approximation. Um, and so we have all these different ways to do it. Okay, so let's write out this automation that we were just talking about. So how we'd approximate a function f of x on the interval a to b using n rectangles. Well, so the first thing we need, needed to do is to have it broken up into the widths. Okay, and so we're going to call those that width delta x. So delta x here is talking about the width of each rectangle. And so how did we calculate that width? Well, if we're, if we're going on the interval a to b, then the length of that interval is b minus a. So that's the total interval. And then we want to break that up into n even sub bits, so n even sub intervals. So we're going to take the total length, b minus a, and divide it by n. And so there, that gives us our width. So this is the width of the rectangles. So now that we need the width, now we need to work out how we're going to figure out how we're going to figure out the heights, right? And so one thing we need is we need to figure out the endpoints of each of these subintervals. And so how are we going to do that? Well, the first one, this first subinterval starts at a, and then how wide is it? Well, it's delta x wide. So it's going to go a, and then the next one is delta x over. So that's a plus delta x. And then the next one is delta x over from that. So that's a plus 2 delta x. And then that's going to bring us all the way down to the last one, which is b, because that's a plus n widths past. And so we can double check if we do n and delta x is b minus a over n. Well, we can see that the n's cancel off. And so this would be equal to a plus b minus a. So the a's cancel off and we end up with b. And so we really do get the last, the right end point of the last subinterval is b in here. So now that we know the subintervals, now we have to pick a height for each rectangle over each subinterval. And so how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to pick the value of the function for some point in the subinterval. So x sub k is some point. in each subinterval. And as we saw, there's lots of different ways we can pick these points. So we can pick the left endpoint, the right endpoint, the midpoint, anything we want to do, so long as it's some point on that interval. And so now we have a width, which is our delta x. We have our height which is the value of the function. And so if we have the width and the height, this is the whole reason of using rectangles. If you know the width of a rectangle, the height of the rectangle, the area is really easy. It's height times width. So it's the value of the function at that xk star times delta x. And so that's the area of each of the sub rectangles. Then to get the total area, to estimate the total area, we're gonna add all of those areas, smaller rectangle areas together. Okay, so this is our estimate for the total area. So remember these f of xk stars, this is talking about height. Delta x is talking about a width. And so when you take the product of them together, this is talking about an area. And so adding up all these small areas is gonna give us an approximation for the total area. So this type of approximation has a special name. It's called a Riemann sum named after a French mathematician, Bernhard Riemann, who uh, was around in the second half of the 18th century, uh, 1800, second half of the 19th century. 
And rather than writing this out with plus signs all over the place, often we shorten it with this sum notation uh, using this, this Greek letter sigma. And so sigma is the Greek letter for S. And so this is telling us that we're doing a sum. And it says the sum is going for, for all values of K starting at one and ending at N. And so this right here is shorthand for saying f of x1 delta x plus all the way down to f of x n delta x. So this is for the first rectangle. And this is talking about the area of the nth rectangle. And so the k equals 1 means we're starting with the first and ending at n, that's saying the last one you add together is the nth. Okay, and so we built this, this Riemann sum uh, to approximate area under a function, but there actually are lots of other useful, um, but they can be useful in approximating other quantities as well. And so let's, let's do an example to see what I mean by that. Okay, so Let's say we have uh, this following data here. It tracks the speed of a car traveling for one hour. So the time is broken up into 15 minute implements. And then we know the speed at each, at each period of time. So let's estimate, let's use this data to estimate how far the car traveled during this time. And so the useful bit of information we need is how do you figure out distance well, if you're traveling a constant speed, distance is equal to speed times time. Very similar to how area of a rectangle is equal to height times width. And so we can use the speed similar to the way that we used height before, and we can use the time implements similar to how we use the width influence before, right? And so we can think about this time going from zero to one hour. We have information at a quarter hour, half an hour, and three quarters of an hour. So we can think about this as happening over four distinct block of times. Now we have information of what happened at the endpoints of each of these. And so we got to choose some way to, to then sort of estimate maybe how much far was traveled over each of these sub intervals, right? So we could use say, same as before, we could use the left endpoints. And so for the first one, we'd use at the beginning, we're traveling 65 miles an hour. And so then we're assuming that was done for 15 minutes. So that would be 0.25 of an hour. Plus over the second half an hour, we can use the value at 15. So we were going 72 miles per hour for a quarter of an hour. Plus for the third one, 68 miles an hour for that quarter hour plus 63 for that quarter hour and that gives us the approximation of 67 miles in total and we also instead of using the left end point we could use the right end point and so in the right end point between zero and 15, rather than using the zero, we use the information at 15. So we, for that first quarter hour, we'd use the 72. Second one from 15 to 30, we'll use 68. Between 30 and 45, we'll use 63. And then for the last one, now we're going to use the value at 60 minutes, and so we'll use 71 
times 0.25, and that's going to give us the estimate of 68.5 miles. And so you can see these two estimates, they're, they're really rather close together, 67 miles, 68.5. So I think we can be pretty confident that, you know, as long as these speeds are pretty typical of how, of how the car was traveling during this time, that it went about this far, about 68 or so miles in that time. Thank you for watching. I will see you again soon.